What's up, everybody? I'm gonna just take a second because I'm excited to see some of my favorite people in person in the flesh. Uh, I'm extremely excited to be here, uh, honored to be here. Uh, if you missed last Sunday's message, first of all, get your life together. Because um, <clears throat> trust me, you need that word. Second of all, uh, do whatever you need to do to make some time to get that message. I believe that the message that I have prepared today is a part two to that message. Uh, this really feels like if Julian, uh, Pastor Julian gave us the what, that this message is the how. Um, I believe that this message is going to be encouraging. Uh, I believe it's going to be challenging. I also believe that this message is prophetic. Uh, and what I mean by that is sometimes if we're not familiar with the prophetic, we'll confuse it for Christian-based fortune telling. But uh, the prophetic simply means that something is predictive to the future, but analytic to the present. And what that means is when we take the time to look at the climate of things socially, spiritually, uh, the conditions around us, and then speak into those conditions from the perspective of Holy Spirit, then we can speak prophetically. So I believe this message is going to be challenging. It's been working on me. So I'm going to preach to myself for the next few minutes. Hopefully you get something out of it. Um, I feel like I'm going to get something out of it. So hopefully we do it together. Um, when Pastor Julian asked me to teach this message, I do what I typically do. Uh, I did what I typically do. I text him back. Of course, I got you. Is there anything specific you'd like me to teach on? And Pastor Julian did what he typically does. He texted me back. Is there anything on your heart? And I text him back. Funny that you asked. Uh, there had been a vision that I had not been able to get out of my head. And it was something that I had just started to unpack, uh, but I felt like I wasn't supposed to start preparing this message until after I heard Pastor Julian's message last Sunday, because I believe uh, one of the first things I got is that they would be related. Um, the vision that I kept having was of sitting in this theater, and uh, dark theater, and on stage there's a magician. Uh, but not like 12-year-old birthday party, like bootleg carnival magician, like uh, like legit, like Vegas, like Cirque du Soleil magician, like, like for, like, illusionist, an illusionist. So not a magician, an illusionist. There's levels to this. Um, it's like the difference between a apostrophe and comma to the top. There's just differences. Um, so there's this illusionist on stage, and he's doing his thing, doing amazing, uh, an amazing show, and sitting next to me, is this, this guy who the entire show, every time the person on stage does a trick, this dude leans over and asks me, hey, did you see how he did that? Are you paying attention? Rude, first of all. And I'm trying to enjoy the show, but he, he continues to do that. And, and he tells me something, and, and I'm trying to pay attention to the show, and, and this is the vision. So I started to unpack that vision after last Sunday. Uh, and I want to say, if you don't know me, I love magic. So I wasn't really thrown off about having a vision about a magician on stage. Uh, I love movies about magic, uh, The Illusionist, The Prestige, both incredible movies. I don't remember if they're age appropriate if you have kids, so check it out before you watch them. Uh, um, but honestly, any movie with the big reveal. So movies like the Ocean's Eleven series uh, or The Usual Suspects or Sixth Sense. The Sixth Sense, which is also, also happens to be the only good movie M. Night Shyamalan has ever made. Um, I'm not going back and forth, debate yourself, uh, but the only good movies ever made. Any movie with a big reveal at the end where they show you how they got away with something throughout the course of the movie. And one thing that all these movies have in common is that anytime there is a big reveal, in order to pull that off, you have to have distraction and deception. Wow. So any good magician, any good showman, they will use distraction and deception to get you to look here so that you don't see what they're doing here. And, and it's, 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 it's key to pulling off what they want to pull off, to pulling off their trick. And I believe there is no greater illusionist, uh, there is no one who is greater at deception and distraction than the enemy, Satan. And that's actually what I want to talk about today. Uh, and I know sometimes we don't often say his name in church. It's like Voldemort, he who shall not be named. Um, but I feel, like, I feel like sometimes we can get over spiritual and give him too much credit for things that we're doing. But I also think there's times that we need to address that we do have an enemy. And it's yeah. important to know our enemy, to know our enemy's strategy, and to know our enemy's goals. Um, the, the enemy loves distraction and deception. His kryptonite is truth. Because truth removes the cloak that sin uses to hide. Uh, in the words of the famous poet Jermaine Cole, 
uh, lies can sound pleasant, but truth can be hurtful. And that's because truth is confrontational. All truth uh, is confrontational by nature, and it can be uncomfortable. And I think that the, the biggest thing is the strategy of the enemy is if he can get us to avoid truth because it's uncomfortable and get us to instead desire lies that make us feel good or that agree with us, uh, one, we won't grow, but we'll also partner with him in keeping ourselves in bondage. Wow. There are many of us, and I have been here, there are many of us who are trying to thrive in the middle of a pandemic on secondhand faith. Wow. What I mean by that is, I didn't grow up in church. I had family members who prayed for me. I had the, the grandmother who was super saved and like she could tell you she could put Jesus in anything. Uh, she's Jesus, 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 Holy Ghost. She knew the Lord. It just you had to walk in her house a certain way, like set your shoes a certain side because like don't shake hands with the left because it, it's, it's crazy stuff. Like I don't even understand. I don't know half of it in the Bible now that I've been reading it, but uh, she was just saved. That's, that's all you need to know. Um, but for years, I do believe God protected me, one, because I'm his son, but two, because there were people praying for me. But when I got into a situation, when I became a husband, when I became a father, when I became a pastor, when I had to go through some life challenges, when I was in a battle, I realized I could no longer win based on the faith of someone else. And I had to get this in my heart for me. And... A lot of us are living on secondhand faith because this may be the last time, the next time you hear the word from seven days ago. If the last scripture you heard was something Pastor Julian read to you last Sunday, you're not going to make it in this pandemic. It's not going to work. My faith will not help your household thrive. My faith can encourage your faith. My faith can stand with your faith and join with your faith. But you have to have your faith and you have to have this truth. And we have someone who is trying to steal our perspective so that he can get to our purpose. And I think a good place to start is to talk about his purpose, the enemy's purpose. Uh, in John 10, verse 10, Jesus lays it out very clearly. He says, the thief, Satan, the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. To steal, kill and destroy. Now, this may be a verse that you've heard several times, but what I want to do in the time I have left is unpack this in more detail um, and talk about his strategies and what he does specifically and what it is he's trying to steal, kill, and destroy. So firstly, the enemy is trying to steal our relationship with the Father through offense. In Proverbs 18, 19, it says that an offended friend is harder to win back than a fortified city. Arguments separate friends like a, locked, a gate locked with bars. Offense creates a blockade. It creates a wall between us and friends. And the thing is, if we're not careful and we don't address that, it can lead to bitterness. And it affects every relationship we have. Some of us are struggling right now in a dating relationship or in a marriage because we are carrying the offense from the last relationship or a previous marriage. Some of us are struggling as parents to be patient with our children who many of them, six, seven, eight years old in elementary school, they don't have the tools as adults that we have. And someday in March, we pick them up and they haven't seen their friends since. But we're losing our temper with them, not because of them, but because we are carrying offense from our parents and our relationship with them. Some of us are at work cursing out our boss because we left a toxic workplace. But the truth is, the only thing that left that business and went to this one was us. And we brought our unhealthy issues with it. And we have to understand that whenever there is offense, there is death. If we refuse to forgive, in Matthew 6, it tells us that if we refuse to give others, God will not forgive our sins. And I think sometimes the reason I have taken a lackadaisical approach to forgiveness is because I didn't understand how serious it was. So I, I, I wasn't always the best at forgiving. I would get cool off people. So now, if you don't have any friends with melanin, what that means is... I, we don't have beef. I don't want to do anything to you. I'm just good if I never see you again. That's what being cool off someone means. So I didn't really, that's not forgiveness. That's just, I'm straight. Like, oh, how they doing? I don't know how they're doing. But just, but then also, that's the person that when you go somewhere, when you ask that, who's going to be there? 
because I need to know if they're going to be there. Because if they're going to be there, I'm not going because I'm straight. There's not going to be a problem. We're adults. We're grown. We have kids. But I'm just cool. That's not forgiveness. The reason I did that is because I didn't understand how serious forgiveness was. I didn't understand that living and choosing to not forgive is actually a sin. And every single time there is sin, there is death. Death and sin are connected. It's all throughout the Bible. Ezekiel 18, 4, the one who sins will die. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. James 1, 15, when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. Sin and death are related. And the thing is, it's not death as we understand it. The death as we understand it is one form of death. We, we, we are most most familiar with the form of death that is the separation of body and spirit. But uh, in Adam and Eve, in the Bible, if you've gotten to as far as chapter 3 in Genesis, it says that when they ate of the fruit, that they would die. Now, clearly, if you've gotten that far, when they bit the fruit, they didn't drop dead. That's not how it happened. But there was a death. Biblically, death means separation. In that moment, there was a separation between them and God. There was a separation in their relationship. If I lose my temper with my son and I've had a rough day or a hard day outside of the house and he doesn't know that and I lose that temper and I take it out on him, there's a separation of trust there. There's a death of that. If I sin against my wife or step outside my marriage, there is a death of a marriage there. Uh, anytime there is sin, there is immediately a death. The solution to that is forgiveness. The enemy is after our perspective so that he can get to our purpose. And the sin of refusing to forgive causes a separation between us and God. If we want a thriving relationship with God, if we don't want Satan to steal our relationship with our Heavenly Father, forgiveness is not optional. It's a prerequisite. No. Secondly, the enemy is trying to kill. What's he trying to kill? Glad that you asked. The enemy is trying to kill the church through division. Uh, anyone who's been in a Zoom group, or this, I know this feels really heavy, but I promise it's gonna be encouraging. Uh, I think that growth comes from being uncomfortable, and I'm uncomfortable right now for you, so if you can just be uncomfortable with me, I think we could get through this. I think it's gonna be a powerful day for us. Um, so I'm aware of that, but I want you to stick through, through this with me. I promise it's gonna be good. Um, Jesus had a prayer request in John 17. If you've ever been in a Zoom group or a connect group or a grow group or a small group at any church across America, you've been in a group, and usually when there's five minutes before we send everybody home, group's about to end, there's always that one person who's like, hey, let's take prayer requests. And now we're here another hour. Yeah. Um, so, so, but just some, but I'm not, prayer is important and prayer requests are important. But if you lead in a group, do time that right. Um, don't be that person, because uh, then I'm not coming back to your group. But um, in John 17, Jesus, before he's arrested and subsequently crucified, Jesus, God in human form, son of God, uh, Yeshua, him, that dude, is having a moment where he has a prayer request. I feel like that's important because if Jesus had a prayer request, I feel like we should pay attention to that. In John 17, let's go to verse 11. Jesus' prayer request before being arrested and crucified with his disciples uh, is, now I am departing the world, they, the disciples, are staying in this world, but I am coming to you, going home to the Father. He knows he's going to the cross. Holy Father, you have given me your name. Now protect them, protect them by the power of your name so that, so that anytime you see terms like so that, uh, Jamaica did an amazing job last Wednesday of giving us some good Bible study tools. Another one that I want to share is when you see certain key phrases like, uh, so that, truly, I tell you the truth. Don't pay attention to what comes before it and after it. So that they will be united just as we are. Now, if you jump down to verse 20, I am praying not only for these disciples, the 12 that are with him at the Last Supper, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one just as you and I are one so that, again, there's that term, so that the world will believe you sent me. Jesus is getting ready to get arrested. He's going to the cross. He's about to lose his, his, his life in human form. And his last prayer request to the heavenly father is, hey, can you protect them? I'm leaving. The shepherd is going. Can you please protect them? But not physical harm. 
not from physical harm, can you protect their unity? So that not just them, every single generation of believer after, including all of us, so that they would know that you sent me. This is like this is his last prayer before going to the cross. And mind you, Jesus is God in human form, so there's nothing he doesn't know. He prayed this knowing we would have different cultures, different backgrounds. He knew that we would have different, different. Uh, different expectations, different religions before we came to know Christ. We would have different family experiences, family structures. He knew how diverse the body of Christ would be, and he prayed for the Heavenly Father to protect our unity. I believe there is so much progress and growth that society has not achieved, that the world has not achieved, because we as the church, we as believers, are not mature enough to have the conversations we need to have to be united enough to spark that growth. I think the division that we're seeing in our world right now breaks the Father's heart, but I think the division in the church breaks his heart even more because the truth is we're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be the example, but... Instead, we, we as, be, as believers, I'm talking about believers. I'm talking about followers of Christ, people who've been baptized, who this is our Lord and Savior. We look like children who were just arguing and bickering to the world outside. We, we're supposed to be the example, but we're arguing over mask or no mask. We're arguing over which lives matter. We're arguing over statistics to use statistics to dismiss our brothers and sisters who were hurt. We're arguing over whose side Jesus would be on, which already says to me, we don't know who he is. Jesus was so conservative that the world rejected and mocked him. He was so liberal that the religious leaders had him crucified. Jesus said he was the way, not left, not right. The enemy is trying to convince us to fight over left or right like two little kids throwing a fit in a tug of war because if we continually fight about going left or right, the only thing that will happen is that we will never move forward. Andy Stanley said that most Christians today seem unable or unwilling to evaluate their politics through the filter of our faith. I think that word our is important. Um, Instead, many Christians today are creating a version of faith that supports their politics. In John chapter 13, Jesus gave us a new commandment. John 13, we're going to start in verse 34. So now I am giving you a new commandment. I know Charlton Heston came down and gave you the first 10, but I'm going to add to that. Um, New commandment, number 11, love each other. Now, Jesus... Again, being all-knowing, all-powerful, God in human form, he knew saying love each other to a group of imperfect people like us probably wasn't enough clarity. Because the truth is, we've all been through some stuff. We have some hurts. I love differently than you love. Not all love feels like love. So he clarified, just as I have loved you, which doesn't leave room for interpretation on our version of love. Hey, love each other, but the way I did it, the example that I set, that's how you should love each other. You should love each other because your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. If you want to prove that you know Christ, if you want to prove that you are a follower of his, if you want to prove that you have the answer for what the pain in the world is going on, then it's not your posts. It's not, it's not a sticker. It's not, it's, it's not a catchy caption on, on something. It's not an argument. It's love for each other, the way that he loved. And it doesn't mean to only love people that agree with us. The enemy is trying to kill the church through division. And the last prayer that Jesus had before going to the cross was to protect our unity because he knew how important it was because the enemy and Jesus both know a divided church is a powerless church. Lastly, the enemy is trying to destroy our mission through fear. Uh, Anybody up here know how many times do not fear or fear not that phrasing is in the Bible? Boom. All right. Julian's going to buy you lunch. Um, So 365, the term do not fear, do not be afraid appears in the Bible 365 times. 
I don't believe in coincidences. I definitely think God did this on purpose because there's literally a reminder for every day of the year except February 29th to not be afraid. Now, <laughs> fear is a natural response. It's, it's a means of protection whenever we feel threatened. It's, it's, it's okay to feel it. It's human nature to feel it. I think the difference is how we respond to it. Fear is not always about physical harm. Uh, we can fear how other people see us so that we modify the way we act. We modify the way we dress. Uh, I may not share everything with you. I may be a different version around myself because if I show you me, you may not like me and I really want to be like. So then we have that fear. Uh, fear of failure is something. Fear of missing out. Salespeople, anyone who's ever talked to a salesperson, they use fear of missing out to make sure that you purchase in that moment, because if you leave, evidently there's not gonna be another car on the face of the planet if you walk out of the building now. Um, or like Costco, like it's on sale today, it's always on sale at Costco. Um, it's amazing, so shout out to Costco. Uh, but fear is not just always about harm. And I think the difference is the easiest way to not fall for the trick of fear is to choose our perspective of fear. Most of us choose worry or concern. Worry is unproductive. Worry leads to anxiety, it leads to inaction, it leads to uh, paralysis by analysis, it leads us to stay stuck and just sit in that fear and dread whatever it might be. Um, but concern can lead us to productivity. Wow. Worry is unproductive, concern can lead to productivity because it can lead us to find the information we need, find the answers we need, to pray, to strategize, to talk to a friend, to get the help that we need. Um, Worry is a substitution for prayer. Concern is motivation to pray. So I think that whenever you're in a situation where you're dealing with fear, whatever your mission is, one, that, that probably means that God is with you because whatever your calling is, if you can do it without God in it, without needing his help, it's probably not from him. It may be a good mission. It doesn't mean it's the God mission uh, because he's going to give us things that make us feel unprepared, that make us feel unqualified because it's a good reminder that we need him and we can't do it by ourselves. None of us can. So uh, I would say lean into that and choose concern over worry. So to, to recap, the enemy, Satan, has a mission. He is trying to steal our relationship with the Father, which is the purpose of the cross. He's trying to kill the spread of the gospel, which is the purpose of the church. And he's trying to destroy our calling, which is the purpose of the mission. The master of illusion is putting on a show like never before right now. Um, except he isn't trying to amaze us. He isn't trying to impress us. He's trying to, he's after our destruction. Uh, it is literally a matter of life and death. And I know some of these things may have been uncomfortable. Last week we talked about uh, agreement and we don't always have to agree to be in agreement and be unified. And if that doesn't make sense, anyone who's married, my wife and I disagree all the time about important stuff, about little stuff. But if you come from me or my wife or our children, you will know what unity is. <laughs> There's a difference, right? that's what I'm saying. Try Jesus, don't try me. Uh, but actually, don't try Jesus either, because just that's not even smart. That's, that's a great song, but that's just not smart. Like old, in the Old Testament, there was one angel that took out 185,000 men. Don't play, don't play with that. Don't play with the Lord. Uh, but um, yeah, so I wanna go back to the vision that I started this message with in closing. I'm sitting in this dark theater and on stage, there's this illusionist who's, who's just putting on an incredible show. The illusionist is Satan. Sitting next to me is God. He's asking me, are you watching closely? Do you see what he's doing? Because the world is at stake and if you don't take my perspective, he will gladly give you his perspective. Wow. There's a lot on the line. If there's anything in this world right now that bothers you, the solution is Christ. The solution is the church. But we have to love each other so that they know we belong to him. We have to be unified so that we can reach them. Because as he said in his own words, Every generation of believers after this depends on that. So I want to close in praying. Thank you for sticking this out with me. Thank you for being here. Hopefully you felt encouraged. Uh, hopefully it, it feels good. Sometimes uh, some messages are 
doctor messages. Sometimes they're surgeon messages. Doctors use a, thes a stethoscope and they want to make you feel better. A uh, surgeon sometimes cuts, but uh, will make you better. So I feel like this might have been a message like that. So thank you for being here uh, and spending some time with us. And I'm going to go ahead and pray us out. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your eyes. Thank you for your perspective, Lord. Holy Spirit, I pray for your eyes and your perspective. I pray that you give us the ability to see the tricks of the enemy, that you give us the ability to walk in forgiveness, that you give us the ability to see the things that divide us and to be unified in spite of those things, God, to not have to agree to be in agreement. And lastly, God, I pray that you give us the ability to step forward in spite of any fear that we may have. Holy Spirit, thank you for the generations who held the torch before us. And thank you that you have entrusted us as this generation to walk through this trial. Thank you, God, that you have equipped us and given us all that we need, the relationships that we need, the word that we need, the revelation that we need, that you have equipped us with what we need to walk the world through this season. I thank you for your church. I thank you, God. And in your word, in Revelation chapter 21, verse 22, it says in the new kingdom, in the new Jerusalem, there is no temple. So rather than arguing over buildings, God, I pray that we read your word and understand that your temple is with your people, yeah. that you are with us, and that any, more, any place that we stand, as Julian said earlier today, is holy ground if you were there. Yeah. Thank you for walking with us, God, and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.